Good evening and welcome to the Redwood Library and Athenaeum in Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, my name is Benedict Lecca, Executive Director, and we are pleased to kick off our virtual lecture series in celebration of Black History Month with Disappearing Inc, Rhode Island Black Literature and the Black Press in Rhode Island. A conversation with Rob Dimmick and Ray Rickman of Stages of Freedom. We're thrilled to be collaborating uh, with Ray and Rob, two serious guys who are always doing very interesting work uh, in a space that we ourselves are committed to, of course. And so we're very happy to welcome them back this evening. This program is generously sponsored by the Jarzombek family, Mark Jarzombek and Michelle Drum. So starting off tonight's conversation is Rob Dimmick, co-founder and program director of Stages of Freedom and author of Disappearing Inc, a bibliography of writings by and about Rhode Island African-Americans. Rob, welcome and thank you everyone for joining us. Good evening, Benedict. Good evening. Thank you so much. Uh, this is actually our third collaboration between the Redwood and Stages of Freedom. Redwood is such a special place um, for us and for the entire community. Uh, an incredible resource and incredibly deep um, history and much of that uh, African-American and African. So it is a pleasure to be able to share with you my work on uh, Disappearing Inc, which before I actually get into, I wanna just give your uh, your viewers, your um, attendees, a sense of um, Stages of Freedom. So Stages of Freedom is a nonprofit. We're based in Providence, uh, right on the river at 10 Westminster Street. And our work is devoted to addressing racial inequities and building bridges of cultural understanding through exciting public programs. We are uh, an award-winning uh, nonprofit, um, thanks to the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities, who in 2018 bestowed upon us the Innovation Award for our work uh, to bridge uh, the racial divide. So for actually 40 years, Ray and I have been involved in really unearthing and telling the magnificent story of African Americans in Rhode Island, and we've done that through uh, countless exhibits, walking tours, lectures, concerts, and performances. Uh, one of our um, most exciting undertakings was creative survival, African-American foodways in Rhode Island from 1790 forward. And that took place at the Culinary Arts Museum, uh, no longer sadly open at Johnson & Wales. Uh, it had the largest attendance, but people were actually turned away from that event. And the event was exciting because um, the artifacts, um, as I say, date as far back as 1790. Um, you can see in the back um, left-hand corner of the photo, um, a, a bowl that was used. Um, it's an elongated bowl for bread making. The earliest artifact was a cheese press used in South County by enslaved women to make what was known as Rhode Island cheese, the uh, foremost cheese uh, in America at that time and exported um, to Europe. We have been involved for at least 20 years to really celebrate Cicerita Jones, um, known as the first black opera diva in America. She grew up on College Hill on the east side of Providence. And in uh, 2018, we celebrated her 150th anniversary with a national conference bringing in um, members from the Met um, to talk about um, things that they have in their archives. We placed a headstone on her um, grave site, which was um, without a headstone because she died in abject poverty. And um, we did a concert, a one woman show, a walking tour. And out of that project came a plaque. Uh, the New York Times gave a um, obituary to her. Uh, because she never received one and certainly should have at the time of her passing. And um, we were also actively involved in the PBS uh, series called Unladylike, in which one of those um, episodes 
focus specifically on Ciceretta Jones. One of our exciting uh, exhibits was called Do Lord Remember Me, the Black Church in Rhode Island, which we brought actually to the Redwood uh, at the end of its tour, uh, beginning at the First Baptist Church in America and Providence, from which the first Black Church in Rhode Island emerged in 1819. It went to the Work and Culture Museum in Woonsocket and ended for a, a month-long stay at the Redwood. Stages of Freedom's name actually was branded through an event that we did before we actually became a nonprofit called Stages of Freedom. And it was an exhibit and a performance series that looked at Black performing arts in Rhode Island uh, with a really wonderful exhibit at the Providence Public Library and a performance at Trinity Rep um, celebrating the return of Rose Weaver who got her start at Trinity. Uh, it was an amazing um, series of um, events and celebrations. And when we um, branded ourselves Stages of Freedom, which actually happened that evening on the stage of Trinity Rep, um, we decided to become Stages of Freedom. Stages of Freedom represents the idea that we are all performing on stages. Um, and particularly for African-Americans, um, we are trying to achieve a stage of freedom that we are constantly um, trying to attain and never seem to. Um, Stages of Freedom has actually been engaged in um, publications on, on many fronts. And one of our first publications is um, Notes of the Negro in Rhode Island Medicine. Uh, Dr. Gross, who you see on the cover there um, in 1963, compiled an um, extraordinary uh, assemblage of, of notes. They were actually handwritten notes. They've all been archived um, at the Spingarn um, at Howard University and at the Rhode Island um, College uh, Adams Library. And many of those notes are now digitized online and um, you'll be able to um, access them when we give you the link to Disappearing Inc. Um, at any rate, um, Dr. Gross is an unsung hero because he did extraordinary research. Um, he was an armchair scholar and, um, as they say, was able to find facts and figures about African-Americans inc incredibly early and deep in Rhode Island history. And so um, we're very pleased to have been able to put that in, uh, in book form. Our start really in the, in the world of literature began at Cornerstone Books, which we founded in 1980 on uh, Brook Street, actually, in Providence. Um, and we quickly became one of the nation's foremost purveyors of rare and out-of-print African-American literature. It's an article that appeared in the um, new paper um, about our business in 1984. And um, we would publish generally quarterly um, catalogs that would go out to private collectors and um, universities who were at that point starting to really collect and take interest in African-American literature. Um, the other things that we did um, at Stages of Freedom um, were to bring um, luminaries, national luminaries like Maya Angelou who appeared at Hope High School. Um, we brought Dr. Henry Louis Gates, his first appearance in Rhode Island was Kindness of uh, Stages of Freedom. We brought author Anne Petrie. She wrote The Street. She comes at the, um, the very end of the Harlem Renaissance and um, The Street was a, uh, a runaway uh, bestseller. Interestingly enough, her sister attended Pembroke Sister College of Brown University. Um, Probably the most exciting event, uh, in-person event, was when we brought James Baldwin to Providence in 1986, I believe it was, um, to the First Baptist Church in America. Uh, we signed the contract, and about a week later, the uh, trustees of the church uh, looked over the contract and decided that they were not going to honor the contract because James Baldwin, who was um, a Baptist, actually a boy Baptist preacher, um, was gay. And um, Ray picked up the phone and called the uh, chair of the, um, the committee and said, I don't think you really want a front page article in the Providence Journal. And so uh, we brought James Baldwin to Providence at the First Baptist Church, which actually brought James Baldwin to his knees. He was so honored to be in the First Baptist Church in America. Um, and the other thing that was incredibly uh, important for him was the fact that we gave about half of the seats away. The seats, I think, cost $5. 
Um, and for $25, you can get a seat and um, a copy of his book. And um, when he looked up and saw hundreds of children, um, he began to weep because he had said it was years since he had spoken before an audience of children. This is the, uh, the program, and it's actually 1985 for um, an evening with James Baldwin. So just a little bit about me, um, and, and very brief. Um, for 30 years, I toured the Eastern Seaboard as Abraham Lincoln. Uh, that's an image of me. Um, and at the 30-year mark, I, um, I hung up my top hat and beard, um, thinking that I'd, um, I'd, I'd done everything I could with Lincoln. Um, in my own publishing um, realm, I've, I've published um, in concert with the exhibit, um, Creative Survival, the piece in Edible Roadie, um, looking at um, George C. Downing of Newport and the African-American um, catering trade. I don't know if I rang the bell for you to see that. Um, I've also on my own done several exhibits and two of them were at the John A. Library at Brown University. Um, both of them called Black Lavender. Um, the second one um, looking specifically at black gay men um, in Rhode Island uh, through a series of, um, of books and ephemera. A lot of um, what eventually became Disappearing Ink um, came out of my own uh, personal library and then um, the library of, um, of Stages of Freedom. And um, I've collected um, books on Bayard Rustin, who was the, um, the lead organizer for the a March on Washington. I've collected books on uh, Paul Robeson, uh, an extraordinary um, leader, performer, and vocalist. And then as I get into the work of Disappearing Inc., I began this project essentially 10 years ago. And as I did so, I was told by the leading scholars of the time, um, good luck, there's not much there. And um, after the five year mark um, in which I went into um, publication, um, I had um, in book form over 900 entries. And um, this is where we start really digging into the remarkable um, aspects of Rhode Island and its seminal moments in um, not only African-American history, but in American history. And this document is really um, part of that evidence. I have to, uh, to thank the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities for making my initial research um, possible um, for that publication. And as we now have digitized that resource and added um, well over another 100 um, items to the bibliography. So we're now over 1,000 um, and counting. I, believe it or not, almost daily and certainly weekly, I'm, I'm working on um, finding um, new citations to add to it. And, and that work, along with the um, council, has been made possible by the Herman H. Rose Civic Cultural Media Access Fund at the Rhode Island Foundation. And I'm indebted to both um, of those wonderful um, resources in our community that make this work uh, possible and visible. And so um, as I began um, thinking in terms of putting this in book form, uh, I needed to cover. And um, I was thrilled to find this image of George Henry, um, who was a, um, a bibliographer um, and a bibliophile. Um, he lived from 1819 to 1895, a very successful uh, businessman, and at the end of his life, um, the collection of books and paintings um, were donated to the historically black Livingstone College. So this is the, uh, the cover of the um, book as it was published. There were only 250 copies. Um, I, I don't even know where all of them went, although I do know, I think, I'm hoping there's one at the Redwood, and if not, Benedict, let me know, and I'll make sure you get um, my last remaining copy. Uh, and I know there's one at the Providence Athenaeum where I um, unveiled um, this project. So um, let's start looking at um, the remarkable stories that um, fill out this bibliography. So the, the first piece of um, writing that I found by an African in the New World, uh, published in Rhode Island, is Phyllis Wheatley's um, On Messieurs Hussey and Coffin, Newport Mercury, 21 December, 1767. Um, and this is actually Phyllis Wheatley's first published piece. 
And so um, to me, that's extraordinarily exciting. Um, and it really puts um, Rhode Island and particularly Newport on the map. Uh, the second piece is um, a musical uh, composition by Newport Gardner, um, Akramur Mericu, 1746 to 1826. He was a master musician, school teacher, and composer. And his Crooked Shanks, which you see here, was um, first published in um, a number of original airs and duettos and trios in 1803. Uh, and so the evidence would show that that's the first published piece of music by an African in the New World. Again, putting Newport and Rhode Island on the map. This is the memoirs of Eleanor Eldridge. Eleanor Eldridge was a successful businesswoman beginning in her childhood as a cheesemaker and um, in adulthood becoming a um, whitewasher and wallpaper hanger in Providence. Um, she owned property, property that was stolen from out from under her by a white man unscrupulously. Um, and um, she spent a great deal of um, trying to win that property back in court. Um, she is the first black woman to um, try a case in court. And in this case, it was for her brother who was mistakenly identified for another black man who'd accosted a white man and she won the case. Um, in order to pay for um, the the expenses of being in court multiple times to win back her property, um, she actually undertook writing her memoir. Memoir was published, um, I believe, on five different editions. This is the original in 1838. Um, it's an incredibly um, scarce item. And it's ghostwritten by Francis Green, a wealthy um, white activist. And that's a story unto itself. This is Alexander Crummel, who was an Episcopal priest in Providence. And um, he wrote to the Free Suffrage Convention, um, which was a plea to the, um, the legislature, essentially, of Rhode Island, uh, that Black men should have the right to vote. And he raised his voice in extraordinarily elegant terms um, in 1842 during the Dorr Rebellion. Um, and believe it or not, Frederick Douglass was actually involved in campaigning throughout the state, uh, a colleague of Crummel, um, to win the right for, for Black men to vote and essentially cut his teeth as an orator um, during that campaign. A lot of the early uh, African-American writing you're going to find are um, what are called slave narratives, which are the stories of uh, Africans and African-Americans um, having been enslaved. Um, and this is um, the life and suffrage of Leonard Black, um, 1847. So again, you know, we cannot overlook the, um, the power and place of Newport um, in the story of um, African-American letters. This is George T. Downing, um, Newport caterer, the foremost, uh, I would say bar any color, caterer in America during his lifetime. Um, and he published in plant, pamphlet form uh, the Colored School Question uh, in 1865. Um, Downing said that he would have been a millionaire had it not been for his passion for um, hip, human and civil rights. He was involved in uh, marriage rights, desegregating uh, schools, uh, desegregating the military. Um, you can go down the list. And he was successful after a 10-year campaign um, to desegregate the schools in Rhode Island. And Maricha Lyons in um, 1869 is the first African-American to graduate uh, from a, uh, an integrated school uh, at Providence High School in uh, Providence, Rhode Island. Another figure that um, Ray and I have been busily bringing to the forefront is William J. Brown. Um, William J. Brown was an extraordinary um, leader of the uh, African-American community on College Hill in Providence. And um, he was extremely well connected with the wealthy white community and was able to get um, many things done that others probably could not have. Um, his memoir, The Life of William J. Brown of Providence, Rhode Island, published in 1883 in Providence, Rhode Island. And we recently discovered why these books are so scarce because um, we actually found a, um, a notice in a newspaper that said that only 500 copies were printed. 
So this book, um, you know, now if you can find it, is well into the thousands of dollars. Um, we're fortunate to have um, our own copy. Um, and William J. Brown is a, a story um, for another evening because um, he's an exceptional um, individual. So we've already mentioned um, George Henry. Um, George Henry published his autobiography in 1894. And again, it's an, a, you know, a real examination of life in, um, in Providence as a black man. And as many um, black writers nationally would do at the time, they would publish their autobiography. And then in the back, there would be an addendum. And it was usually a way of educating um, the black community. So it may be bringing to light other uh, African-Americans of note, um, historical moments. Um, and so within his, um, bib, uh, his uh, autobiography um, are similar um, addendums. This is uh, Emma Dunham Kelly. Um, she's a fascinating figure, uh, born in Dennis, Massachusetts, moves to, um, to Providence and writes a book called Four Girls at Cottage City. And it's a fascinating story because it's one of the first books by an African-American, and in this case, an African-American woman, that blurs the lines of race. So that um, one isn't really aware when they're reading that it is about four young black women on vacation in Massachusetts. Um, the image that you just saw of Emma Kelly um, herself blurs the uh, distinction of race. And there's even some, um, you know, research that's being done as to whether whether or not she really was uh, African American or was she was posing as an African American. Um, that. Um, has yet to be determined. At any rate, um, we sold a copy of this, believe it or not, to uh, Dr. Gates at the beginning of his career as a, um, you know, he could have actually had his own publishing house, but um, he published a series called the Schomburg Collection. And um, we introduced him to this book. And um, a couple of years later, it appeared um, in the Schomburg Collection. And so that goes back to the work that we did at um, Cornerstone Books, which was bringing to light um, books that, um, even scholars at that time were not necessarily um, aware of. Believe it or not, we sold a copy of uh, Phyllis Wheatley's first book to um, an academic. Um, we could have easily sold it to a university for double or triple, but it was much more thrilling to us to sell it to a black scholar, in this case, a black female scholar, uh, for her to put in her collection. Um, and that was a wonderful moment in our, um, our business lives. This is Olivia Ward Bush Banks. Um, she was um, a poet living from 1869 to 1844. Um, her first book, Original Poems, was published in 1899, receiving glowing reviews from the foremost African-American poet at the time, Paul Lund Lawrence Dunbar, who, believe it or not, visited um, Newport and gave a speech there um, during his relatively short life. Her second book, Driftwood, was published in 1814. Um, and she counted among her friends, W.E.B. Du Bois, Langston Hughes, uh, County Cullen, and was instrumental in getting um, the career started for Richmond Barté, an extraordinary black sculptor, and um, Paul Robeson as he began his um, singing career. This is Pastor Henry Jeter, um, again, a luminary from Newport. He lived from 1851 to 1938. He was the longest serving pastor of Newport's Shiloh Baptist Church. He was there for 42 years, starting in 1875, and um, was a, um, a real um, mover and shaker, not only in the black, but in the white church um, world. Uh, he raised a family, a large family of violin players, and they would actually tour the country as the Jeter uh, family. And this is a copy of the book. Again, um, we don't know how a uh, few copies were actually printed, but it, it is hard to find. I think we've had two copies in our, um, in our existence as cornerstone books. This is Fanny Coppin Jackson, living from 1837 to 1913. She moved to Newport as a youth, attended Rhode Island Normal School. 
She was a teacher, a principal, a lecturer, and a missionary to Africa. And um, Coppin State University, a black university in Baltimore, is named for her and honors her uh, legacy. This is Sarah Collins Fernandez. Um, her poems, published in 1925. She was a leader in what was known as the Settlement House Movement. She came to East Greenwich in 1908 uh, to better the lives of the uh, Black community who lived in what was known as Scallop Town, um, which was often referred to as a shanty town. Um, and these were African Americans who made their living um, digging scallops and selling them. And um, she did extraordinary work there um, until uh, 1912, at which point um, the community, as we understand it, was um, kind of dissipated. Another um, leading light in Newport is William Stanley Braithwaite. This is him um, as a rakishly handsome young man. Um, Braithwaite was an editor and an, and an anthologist and he discovered folks such as Robert Frost, who um, never forgave him uh, for discovering him. Um, Robert Frost was an avowed racist, and the fact that he was discovered by a black man did not sit well with him. Uh, he discovered Rachel Lindsay and countless more um, poets and um, would publish, uh, it seems almost uh, annually, um, anthologies, as um, you see in um, the screen here. Um, this is one of them. Uh, the Braithwaite Anthology, uh, Year of American Poetry for 1928. And so he was essentially uh, presenting a survey of American poetry and in many cases introducing for the first time um, who would soon become the great uh, poets of our American age. Rhode Island claims a Harlem Renaissance writer. And, and um, for us, that is extremely important. And one of the probably most remarkable Harlem Renaissance writers as far as um, his uh, small but important output. Uh, he lived from 1897 to 1934. He was a valedictorian at Classical High School in Providence and again at Brown University, uh, giving the um, student uh, oration at both those schools at the end of his um, careers. He studied biology and English at Brown and um, moved to New York and um, became a, essentially a radiologist um, and um, a writer. Uh, we sadly lose him uh, very early in his life because of his exposure to radiation. But he invents the black mystery novel. Um, and here you see his Conjure Man Dies, a Harlem mystery. Um, so an extraordinary figure on the literary front um, of Rhode Island. The last figure I'm going to leave you with is Rose Butler Brown. She's the author of Love, My Children, and Education of a Teacher. Um, you see uh, particularly Black women who write um, from this point back um, using their voice to educate and to um, discuss the importance of education. Um, she lived from 1897 to 1972. She attended URI. She was the first Black female PhD uh, at Harvard in the education department and has a dorm name for her at Rhode Island College. Uh, many of the items that um, you've seen and many, many more um, in this uh, brief talk are in the Stages of Freedom collection. The collection um, has been um, funded by the Providence Journal Legacy Fund and named for James N. Ray, who you'll learn about shortly uh, as part of our uh, African-American Museum um, which fingers crossed will open um, later this month. The last um, image I'm gonna leave you with is um, another really important database um, called On the Road to Freedom, which is a town by town guide to African-American sites in Rhode Island. So if you visit stagesoffreedom.org, um, you'll find both of those icons. You simply click them and they'll take you immediately to either Disappearing Inc. or On the Road to Freedom. Um, and so at this point, um, I'm going to switch chairs with Ray Rickman as um, Benedict comes back on. Thank you, Rob. Uh, remarkable erudition in this entire world that, that so few people are familiar with. Uh, really fascinating. So I want to thank you for that. 
Uh, next, I want to welcome to the screen Ray Rickman, co-founder and executive director of Stages of Freedom, as he continues our discussion of the Black press in Rhode Island. So please help me welcome Ray Rickman. Thank you all so much. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I am, um, you know, every day of my life I get up, I'm excited about the work I'm doing. Um, and I'm excited about the people I work with. It's actually um, intriguing, maybe once a day. We, we've become the center of kind of what's going on in Black culture and Black history, and someone calls me and tells me something or shares something with us or sends us an email, and you just go, wow, are you joking? I didn't know that. <laughs> well, sadly, 99% of us don't know very much about Rhode Island Black history. And uh, we're very uh, appreciative of Redwood for uh, taking this subject and issue and problem up and saying if we can't elevate uh, Black history. Now, what do we want to elevate Black history for? Well, the more people know about other people, the better. Also, it is important to know that people have foundations. You know, there were the Native people, and then there were the Anglo-Saxons, the English, basically, and then there were the African-Americans. So, you know, the three groups that actually uh, made this um, colony possible. Now, I want to talk about the Black press with you for the next 15, 16 minutes, because, again, it's an area that we don't know much about. Um, as early as the 1860s, there was a Black paper, Reverend George uh, Holland created it. Uh, uh, Lou Perchard is the newspaper, and we know this much about it, meaning almost nothing. And I've read William J. Brown's um, autobiography maybe four times. And every time I go through it, I find something new. Uh, you would think that I would find it every time, but you don't. It's just jam-packed. And this time I'm reading through it and he talks about, he worked on this black newspaper in the 1860s. And I must have read it before, but it didn't grab me. Why? Well, we're doing a conference this June or July on the black press. And so everything I see or hear about the black press uh, just congeals in my brain. And so there's William J. Brown in 1873 talking about a black newspaper with a radical name. Wow. So you'll hear more <laughs> in a few months about this. We're on the search to find a copy. We're on the search to uh, find ourselves a researcher to help us uh, get more. Um, so stay tuned. So now we go to the Reverend um, W.S. Holland, Providence Watchman, and it's 1900. And this is based on Tuskegee. Um, this Tuskegee Institute had a chapter in Rhode Island and first in Providence and then it moved uh, north. And he created this newspaper. And again, we don't know as much about it as we're going to know uh, just because we're going to. And in the next five or six months, so again, stay tuned. We um, want to talk about someone we've been learning a lot about, um, Charlotta Bass. And she contributed to the Providence Watchman, which we were just talking about. And then more exciting, she's the owner and editor of the California Eagle. Now, this is after she was a graduate of Hope High School and a graduate of, well, she went to Pembroke at Brown. And this is big stuff to go to Pembroke at the turn of the century, black woman. And she walked to school. She lived <laughs> eight or nine blocks from Brown. And actually, uh, originally she lived on Thayer Street, two blocks from Brown. This is really something. I, I want you to understand 
in all those classes, there are one, two, maybe three black women. And it ain't easy to get in. And as she said, it wasn't easy to stay. Uh, half the students ignored you and the other half did everything but give you a beating. Uh, you did not belong in an elite uh, Pembroke as far as almost all of the students were concerned. So again, an intriguing woman, she goes to California, she gets married and she ends up owning the California Eagle. First woman black in America to own, edit, publish her own paper for nearly ever. And in the meantime, basically on the Socialist Party, she runs for vice president of the United States in one of those years and they didn't do well. So you haven't particularly heard very much about her. So uh, then we uh, come to um, Olivia Ward uh, Bush Banks, and she's a contributor to Colored American, which is maybe my favorite newspaper. Extraordinarily well done. Lots of literature, lots of literature in this newspaper. And as you know, there generally isn't a lot of literature in newspapers. Providence Journal used to have two, three, even four literary pages on Sundays. And now it's down to half a page. And uh, you just don't, you got to go to the New Yorker <laughs> in order to get a little literature. But she wrote unbelievable columns and articles for the Colored American. Fanciful, fanciful newspaper out of Boston. And she was an intricate part of it. So um, then we come to John Carter Minkins. And he's big stuff, okay? <laughs> Providence News Democrat. Oh, you never heard of it. It's not a black newspaper. It is white. And it's the second leading paper uh, right behind the Providence Journal in uh, Providence. And he, black man, is the editor. D did you hear that? <laughs> In 1906, he is the only black editor of a white-owned newspaper in America. Now, I do all this cultural and historic stuff because I'm interested, but I tell everybody the truth. My second interest is getting people to understand the racist foundation in which this nation is built, the state is built, the city of Providence, Newport, and almost every place else. You can't get a job, no matter how skilled you are, if you're black. But he beats it. He gets a job, and he's the boss. And this is a real newspaper. Providence News uh, Democrat has about 65 employees. The journal has maybe 100 at that time. But this is quite the paper, and he's quite the uh, person involved. Now, he also writes a Sunday article, I believe monthly, uh, we're chasing it down. But he writes an article directed at African Americans for the Boston Globe. Now, the Boston Globe, like every other major white paper in America, neglects, or worse, uh, black people. Except one Sunday a month, it has a little four-page insert for the black community to come and buy the paper so that they can find some black news. Did you hear that? <laughs> and he's the lead writer for that. This is an intriguing, intriguing man and civil rights advocate and has uh, involvement media for almost 70 years. Now, one of my favorite people, uh, James Ray, uh, pretend it's R-A-Y, R-H-E-A, Providence Journal. You see those dates, 1950, 1983. Now let's come again to racism. Now I tell people about all this racism. Sometimes people say, why are you telling us about all this racism? Because uh, what your father was or even what you were determine what goes on. So all the major newspapers in America, starting with the New York Times, they have one black writer, New York Times being very liberal, very progressive. By 1960, New York Times has three 
black writers. Now, I don't know how many hundreds of writers the Times had, but it had three black writers. All these other papers, Boston Globe, Providence Journal, you name them, Detroit News, they have one black writer. They never have more than one black writer. You see his dates, 1950, 1983. And then after um, sometime in the 90s, sometimes they have two black writers. The journal has one and a half at any given time. That's all. And, uh, and what do I mean by one and a half? Well, a couple of times they have two black writers, but every time a black writer leaves, it's two or three years before they find a replacement. Now, white writer leaves and they get a replacement the next day or before the person leaves. These papers can't have but one black writer, and James Ray is it. And he is an award-winning uh, writer. He goes um, to the South and wins a Pulitzer Supra, uh, a pro, uh, <laughs> award. It is quite the person. Now, I tell people, I came here in 1979, and in 1980, I'm walking across uh, Kennedy uh, in front of the um, Biltmore Hotel, and a man walks up to me, and he says, are you Ray Rickman? And I say, yes. And he says, you have the new job at the Providence uh, Human Relations Commission? I say, yes. And he said, I wanted to write the inaugural story about you, but they wouldn't let me. And I said, oh, who are you? And he says, I'm James Ray. And we sat there in Burnside Park for two and a half hours. And he tells me the history of the journal, only back to 1950. He doesn't tell me any, any history that he wasn't involved in. And he tells me every wretched thing they did to the black community, that newspaper, how they were so anti-affirmative action, they were anti this, they would not hire a person of color beyond him, and on and on and on. And then a uh, sad moment when he tells me uh, that there was a big murder, um, and it was the biggest murder of the Providence Journal's history. And he was at that time, for those two years, he was in charge of uh, crime. Uh, and they gave him crime because you had to go to the court. They had night court. <laughs> and you had to be up at two and three in the morning. And nobody particularly wanted it. And he got it. So two months after he becomes the crime writer, it's the biggest murder story. You know, all the newspapers are down from Boston and New, ha New, New Haven and every place else to cover this awful crime. And they take it away from him. They say, oh, this is a big story. And they take it away from him and they have three other people and then he ends up being the bottom writer. And this has happened a week or two before I came to be head of the Providence Human Relations Commission. And it was actually sad. You could see the look in his face. I have been abused at this newspaper for 30 years. So that's James Ray. Doug Terry, my friend, he's the editor publisher of everything of the Ocean State Grapevine. And this is a, a paper with one and one-fourth employees. He had somebody who helped in this, uh, distribution. Uh, they worked on Saturday, helped distribute the paper. And he distributed three-fourths of them, and they did the rest. And the, I, I was an employee of the paper, too, and I didn't get paid. Uh, I got him... Uh, new subscribers. That was my job. Uh, he had about 400 black subscribers, and I would get him a new white subscriber every week. That was my goal. And I, I won all that successful. Uh, he overcharged. <laughs> he needed money. And I would go get uh, somebody. You had to pay for the paper. And I would go get somebody to subscribe to the paper. Uh, and he was a uh, coach at Brown. And so he had, I believe, this is memory, and you know what good memory is. <laughs> he had about 400 black subscribers. He had 50 uh, professors and um, sports people and the like at RISD and Brown. And then I brought him 50 white folks from College Hill and the like. So he ended up with 500 subscribers to his black paper. Now, the unique thing about this is, you ready? And Dr. King said this, 
Uh, the black papers read 99% by um, black people and every once in a while the FBI. <laughs> and I really do mean that. So the white community has no clue of what's going on in the black community because they don't read the black paper in segregated society. And this society was and is segregated when it comes to the black media. And there's good stuff in there. You know, Muhammad Ali comes to town and front page of the paper and it's real stuff, real interview, chasing him down Broad Street, uh, getting comments from him. Uh, nothing you'd ever read in the New York Times or the Boston Globe because the great boxer wouldn't talk so freely except with a black reporter. So this is the power of the black press. If you read about Dr. King in his years, uh, you know, on the national scene, first he's in the black paper all the time, every week, and his thoughts, things he would never say to the white press and they wouldn't ask him. So there is so much uniqueness and power and excitement in the black media and the Ocean State grapevine, single-handedly with a little help, uh, Doug Terry. Then we come to my friend, Frank Graham. I like black uh, editors, publishers, you know, and I try to help them out. Now, in his case, I really was uh, a helper. Uh, I was in the General Assembly, and he, like all other black press, was in trouble all the time. And he had no money. And uh, he had a job. He was the first black reporter uh, on television at uh, Channel 6, wow. uh, Channel 12 in Providence. So uh, he had a real job, and then he thought he'd go run a paper, and his income dropped by three-fourths. He didn't know that was going to happen. But there he was all the time, and his wife was saying, why don't you get rid of this thing and get a job? And so one day I went over to his office. He was on the third floor on Washington Street, actually where the um, humanities, uh, Rhode Island Humanities Office is now. And he was there. And I went over and I was talking to him and he was telling me he was going to have to give this up and we weren't going to have a black paper. And I said, you got to have a black paper. What are you talking about? And so this was on a Saturday. We had this little conversation in the morning. And I told him I would help. And I didn't think I needed to help much, but I needed to help him. Uh, his income was about a fourth of what it used to be. And I go off to the Star Market grocery store where Whole Foods is on North Main. And who do I see in there shopping all by himself? A bodyguard chauffeur sitting in the car. And I go in and there's the governor. And I say, hey, governor. And we have our little kibitz for two minutes. And he wants to talk about legislation. And I said, I don't want to talk about legislation. I need you, Governor Ed Dupree, I need you to save the black paper. And he said, well, how would I do that? I said, give him, give him some advertising dollars. You give every single penny to the Providence Journal. And there's no law saying that you can't give him 20,000 bucks a year. That's all I said in advertising. And the governor says, okay, I'll do it. I said, thank you, governor. I said, is that? He said, yes. I went home and I called Frank Graham and I said, guess what? Governor of Rhode Island is going to give you 20,000 bucks a year. Well, he didn't give him 20. He gave him 50. Do you know how much $50,000 was in 1988? <laughs> and uh, the black paper stayed around. Providence, America. Then he sells it to Peter Wells. Uh, Peter Wells had had a big time government job. He was head of the vets. Now this is typical of black editors, publishers, uh, people who run black newspapers. You can't make any money. Uh, they're not nonprofits as a rule. And so you can't even go to Rhode Island Foundation and beg some money. You're on your own. And the black community is small. And the black businesses are small and the advertisements are small. And every once in a while, if you get the right governor, you get $5,000 worth of ads uh, from the state. And if Buddy Ciancy's the mayor of Providence, you can get 5,000 from him. But again, that doesn't help you with staff. It barely helps you with your salary. It doesn't help you with rent, but Peter Wells has pension and a good human being. 
and he decides, I'm going to run this paper, and as you can see, the dates from 2006 to 2018, with very little cash, uh, he made the Providence American work and expand. It was just thrilling. And one day he calls me up and he says, Ray, would you like to buy the paper? And I said, I didn't want to buy it when Frank was selling it, and I don't want to buy it now. Why would I do that? And he said, because this community needs a paper. Uh, again, I want to stress this. There are maybe in this country three or four black papers that are financially successful, 50 in this country that barely work. And I think the very next black newspaper needs to be a nonprofit so that it can try to do both uh, revenue streams. So out goes the black paper. There is no black paper for four years. Uh, we're dependent on the kindness of strangers, Providence Journal in most cases, and import uh, newspapers. And there's coverage, but not like there should be, not like there used to be, not like there should be. And when you have a church affair in which three, four hundred people come, and it's big, you don't get the coverage because black events have never gotten the coverage from white mainstream press. Now, I see only one example, and it's stunning. The New York Times, and every place I go, I tell, I tell people. The publisher who went to Brown University realized that New York City is 51% black, Latino, Asian, and his paper on a given day, today it was a little thin, it was only like 25% people of color in that paper represented. But there are days it's 40, 50%. Unbelievable for a majority white paper in this country. We now have coming the Black Star. Hopefully on the 26th of February, it will emerge at Brown University as a black newspaper first black newspaper at Brown University in its 240 year history. And to be run by a young man who was, uh, worked at Washington Post one uh, summer, uh, is in journalism and thinks, and I pray, understands how to make a paper go. And he's going to reach beyond the walls of the Ivy League school and educate, entertain, accept uh, the black community of Rhode Island. And I would urge everybody to get their self inaugural issue. Uh, by the way, it's a uh, monthly. Uh, he says a gloriously big, wonderful monthly. Uh, we'll see and my prayers are with him. Thank you very much, uh, Ray. Um, really amazing work that you guys have been doing is just astounding, really. Uh, the erudition, the, the, the knowledge, the, the, the depth of the history that is, uh, well, that's in many ways been omitted, I think we can say. Uh, I'd like to open it up to viewers. If anyone has any questions for Rob and Ray, uh, I'm, I believe there's one question. Let me grab it here. One unanswered question. Hello, can you recommend any black women who published poems in papers? I would love to learn about some writers who are not well known, but who deserve some attention. That's from Sarah Holmes. Well, yes, we, we mentioned Olivia Ward Bush, who um, not only published in book form, but in um, in the black press. Um, I mentioned um, Sarah Fernandez, um, who also published um, poetry, Phyllis Wheatley. Um, the bibliography um, will reveal uh, much more um, both historically and um, contemporarily. Um, so again, I encourage you to visit stagesoffreedom.org, click the icon for Disappearing Ink, 
and visit the bibliography. And I guarantee you that bibliography will grow. Um, by the end of this year, I promise another 100 um, entries from um, the, work, the work that I continue to do um, to unearth uh, both historical and uh, new works. And there are always new things coming out. Um, and this isn't just books. Um, and this is not just um, books by African Americans. It's, it's uh, other scholars writing about the African American um, experience um, in Rhode Island. Um, so as you go through the bibliography, you're going to find sections on slavery, uh, African Americans in the Revolution, African Americans in the Civil War. There's a whole section on African Americans in the church. Um, that's an intriguing and fascinating section. There's a juvenilia section. Uh, there's a whole section on biographies and then an entire section that specifically identifies African-American authors, um, regardless of what their, um, their genre is. Mm -hmm. So now get ready. Uh, Crystal Williams has been named the new president of RISD. And uh, I read, uh, I don't know, two years ago, I read a couple of her poems. And uh, two months ago, I read 30 of her poems. Uh, you know, I want to be uh, the most knowledgeable on <laughs> the poet at uh, RISD. And so I would urge uh, your, re your listeners uh, to uh, get Crystal Williams' uh, books. And uh, uh, one of them is Detroit as Barn, uh, Barn, uh, you know, Cow Barn. And uh, I think she has, uh, she has four books of poetry and travel. <clears throat> You're talking about a new, and we're going to claim her, new Rhode Island poet, Crystal, Crystal Williams. Uh, gentlemen, we have a question from J. Richard Dernan, who is often listening. Um, how do we subscribe to the Black Star, he asks. I don't think you do. Um, he, oh, I'm sorry, it's going to be up electronically. So my guess is you wait till the 26th and go online and click. Um, if you want to send an email to Stages of Freedom, because we're going to push it out, the first issue, we're going to push out to 12,000 people. Yeah, so we, we do a um, five-day-a-week um, e-blast uh, with important information relevant to the Black community. We've also been doing, uh, for two and a half years, um, a section every... Um, every day for those uh, five days a week, specifically relevant to COVID. Uh, it's called Connected. So if you email me at stagesoffreedom at AOL.com, we will add you to our listserv and you'll get that every morning at 9 a.m. It's really fascinating. And this month in particular, we're looking at African-American uh, Rhode Island uh, con contributors to this history. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna have three days of Black Star at the end of the month, so e email us. Maybe you might want to just give us a few words about the pending opening of the museum. And yeah. it seems to So uh, would you like an interesting dialogue? I'd love to share. I learned this from my mother. No matter what you think, when you get out in the real world, you'll find it's different. <laughs> So we've raised a decent amount of money to open a museum and we can open one tomorrow. But we didn't raise enough to do fancy stuff in the back room, to pull the television camera out of the ceiling for young people when they come in to do, to do, to do. And I'll give you an example of something. I love sharing this. Uh, so I asked somebody very prominent if we could borrow a painting from her to create excitement. And her agent called me and said, tell me about your alarm system, your security system. You know, on what level is it? And I told him. And he said, that's inadequate to borrow from us. And he said, no museum in America is going to loan you. They're just not going to do it. So you can have a $10,000 system, which is what we we're looking at. Or you can have a $35,000 system, which is what we need. So we've been holding off because everything's like that. Is this going to be a $300,000 museum or a $110,000 museum to, to open, I mean? And I think it's going to be a $300,000 museum because we're days away from somebody stepping up with, you know, 100, 180000 additional dollars for our museum. 
And again, I just gave you the example. You can open a museum in which you can never borrow anything, probably from the Redwood or anybody else, because in spite of having the whole thing alarmed, it doesn't have, you know. <laughs> so we're, we're excited. Uh, COVID has uh, stopped us from opening on the lower level as well. And so sometime probably in March. And we, um, this museum will have permanent exhibits on the history of Blacks in Rhode Island. And then it will have uh, changing exhibits all the time. It will have Sister Retta Jones all the time. It will have the history of the Black church. It will have, it will have, it will have. Uh, today, I'm standing looking at this fabulous panel. And it is Black restaurant from Newport. And it is so stunning. I think it's probably eight or nine feet wide and six feet tall. And we have to put that on something where we can pull it out all the time. So I'm talking to a manufacturer and they want uh, $1,100 for us to do this. Uh, everything's like that, everything. Well, uh, good luck. And certainly we have some technical expertise here at the Redwood for museum installations. So we'd be happy to, uh, you know, do what we can to help you out as always. Mm -hmm. uh, gentlemen, uh, really amazing work. I mean, it is just such a rich history. Uh, it's remarkable that, um, well, that it's been omitted essentially in many ways, you know, and to- Can I say one quick thing? Um, sure. New, and Rob was talking about this. Newport has all of this incredible, rich African and then African American history, uh, pre, you know, almost pre-colonial times, and, uh, and I'm sorry, pre-colonial times, and and that's not a very long period. And then you have colonial time, and then you have uh, us as a state, and it's our job not to be neglectful of any part of Rhode Island, we're a statewide organization. But it would be just so wonderful if five years from now, we said, this is the black history of Newport and every other Newporter knew it. And that's what we're gonna try to do. Uh, and again, I'm not saying this because we're talking to you. I was telling you about my Newport work this morning. We are not neglectful of any of the 39 towns or cities. And some of that, of course, is uh, Rhode Island Humanities helping us. Every time we get a grant from them, they want to say, and, and, and who are you talking to? <laughs> and we say, everybody that we can. Um, and I think it's really important as we leave you tonight to, to talk about this history as a shared history. It's not a black history. It's not a white history. It's an intertwined history um, that comes out of incredible um, pain and misery and from it, um, these remarkable individuals, extraordinary accomplishments, and the height of excellence. And that's, I think, our success as both a black and a white man engaged in um, this journey to tell these stories and bringing um, a diverse audience to these stories and in what we call safe spaces where they can experience them with a lot of joy and a lot of opportunity for exchange. Benedict, thank you for the time. Seriously. You're welcome. Thank you both so much. Uh, I just want to tell everyone that our Black History Month lecture series continues next week with two lectures. Please join us Wednesday, February 16th for the Music Appreciation Series with Dr. Mark Ward, Black Composers and Their Contributions to American Classical Music, Part 1 of a two-part series. And on Thursday, February 17th, Dr. Brenna Wynn Greer, Associate Professor at Wellesley College, will be discussing Black History Month and the perils of symbolic blackness. So for more information and to register, just visit our website. If you're not members, please join. And we sure would appreciate it if any of you might consider subscribing to the Redwood channel. So. With that, I leave you all. Thank you all so much. And my salutations to Rob and Ray for another great presentation. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Good night.